Good evening and welcome to the 49th Paul Lester Arrington Memorial Lecture. We'd like to thank our sponsors who made all this possible tonight. Uh, those sponsors include the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, the College of Design Lectures Board, the Department of Agronomy, the Department of Natural Resource Ecology and Management, the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Organismal Biology, the uh, Iowa Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, particularly the F. Wendell Miller Lecture Fund. And finally, we'd like to thank the Committee on Lectures, funded by Government of the Student Body. That's you, Cyclones. Thanks for uh, helping making this uh, happen tonight. Um, uh, which brings me, the student body brings me to the, my little part on etiquette. There is an etiquette to this, to these occasions. The professoriate feels very strongly that good form is that we all stay chill and relaxed and seated until the question and answer period is over. Okay, and right after the question and answers, uh, the nice people with the computer out in the hallway will enable the special device where you can swipe your ID card and get credit for attending this lecture. Also, you wouldn't want to miss the excellent treats in the back of the room right after the question and answer period. So do stick around and, you know, uh, be convivial uh, with the rest of us. Um, it is a big deal, this named lecture. It is a very special occasion. And it was uh, created to honor the memory of Paul Arrington, who came to Iowa State College in the year 1932. And uh, he came with a letter of recommendation for this new job from Aldo Leopold. He was the first director of the first Cooperative Wildlife Studies Research Unit in the nation, right here at ISU back in 1932. In 1936, when Leopold published his book, Game Management, Arrington, Paul Arrington, was one of the six professors nationwide that Leopold looked to for professional you know, comments on that book. So we remember Arrington for his work in population ecology. Back in that day, uh, hunters feared that a predator would destroy a game population. You really needed to get rid of those predators. And what Arrington did, was to, for hunters and for science, he redefined the meaning of predation. Secondly, we remember Arrington uh, because he loved the marshes of the Midwest. He spent thousands of hours in all kinds of weather out there in the marsh studying muskrats and other critters. He was part of that natural history tradition. You know, observation was central and key. He loved those marshes, and he talked in his memoirs about you know, his sense of adventure in the great outdoors as a hunter with gun in hand or not, or without his gun. He talked about the beauty of nature. He wrote uh, this line, I have heard the red gods call all my life. And that's what he meant was adventure and the beauty of nature. In 1957, Arrington wrote this book called Of Men and Marshes. And he talked uh, in eloquent terms about ducks and the seasons going by. He talked about the spiritual values, the human values that he found in bits of wilderness scattered throughout the Midwest in amidst this agricultural landscape. He was concerned about disappearing wetlands in his own time, and he became an early advocate for wetlands. If Leopold des, uh, you know, devised a land ethic, surely Arrington devised a marsh ethic. Leopold's daughter told me a story back when he was studying at the University of Wisconsin, Arrington. Uh, Arrington showed up over at the Leopold house all in a flurry one day, and he says, oh, I gotta learn how to dance right now. And so Leopold's daughter taught in one easy lesson, uh, taught him how to dance, and uh, pay attention, gentlemen, and it worked like a charm because he charmed the girl that he was interested in, Carolyn Storm, and who married him. And a lucky thing for Arrington, because Carolyn was a great editor. She was a law student, and she was a fine editor. And she helped you know, refine his ideas and helped him bring his ideas about marshes and their beauty to a public audience. Carolyn attended this lecture for many years. She lived uh, to over the age of 100, and she left us just a, two years ago. 
but she left us a legacy in this lecture series that she and other generous donors started uh, 49 years ago. Uh, Professor Sue Blodgett would now like to introduce a very special guest that we have amongst us this evening. Well, speaking of Professor Arrington, we have somebody with us tonight who sat in the very in the first row of his the first class that he taught at ISU, Principles of Wildlife Management. He was a very dear friend of both Professor Arrington and his wife. And he and Jim Dinsmore were the first co-chairs of the Arrington Memorial Lecture um, Committee. And so um, I'd like to have Dave Trauger and his wife Alice stand. Um, he traveled down from Minnesota to be with us tonight, and he's been a generous donor. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. So the Arrington Lecture is a very special occasion. And uh, now to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Professor Diane Dubinsky of EEOB. Thanks. It's great to see such a wonderful turnout this evening. So I thought I'd introduce our speaker. But before we get to that stage, I, would, I want to do the segue by asking, what would Paul Arrington think of the topic you're going to hear about tonight? Um, he, uh, re remember, I don't know if you, how many historians we have in the audience, but you might recall that Paul Arrington died in 1962. Uh, the first satellite went up in 1957, and the main goal was not actually ecological research at that time. Uh, some of you might know that it was difficult to get satellite data, uh, and so in the pa it's only in the past few decades that we could actually get long-term satellite data that's accessible and not too expensive. Uh, similarly, the field of macroecology, which you're going to hear about tonight, is only about two decades old. Uh, it's the study of spatial relationships between organisms and their environment at large spatial scales. And these are used to characterize and explain statistical patterns of abundance, distribution, and diversity, thinking of biodiversity. So Paul Arrington uh, probably would not have thought about using remotely sensed imagery, and he'd probably not heard the term macroecology. But Paul Arrington did have a broad vision of conservation and conservation at the landscape scale. So if you recall, of men in marshes and some of those, those themes that would have been conservation at the landscape, landscape scale. So I, spec I suspect that Paul Arrington would have been highly intrigued by the research you're going to hear about tonight. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeremy Kerr. Uh, he is a macroecologist. He analyzes patterns of species distribution at a continental scale to detect changes, particularly in relation to climatic change. His primary research seeks to discover specific causes for biodiversity decline and degradation of ecosystem function. Uh, discoveries from the Kerr Lab have been used to improve conservation activity by resource extraction uh, industries as well as national parks. Professor Kerr works with colleagues across Canada to inform decisions about the species uh, at Risk Act, which is equivalent to our Endangered Species Act. Dr. Kerr has received numerous awards. For example, the University of Toronto's program in science leadership selected him as a fellow. He will soon be serving a two-year term as president of the Canadian Society for Ecology and Evolution. And most recently, he was uh, uh, awarded a research chair, which is what they do. Uh, it's like an endowed professorship at uh, Canadian universities. And they, they uh, specifically picked these emergent, emerging issues, which is similar to what we've been doing around here at this university. Uh, so we picked these emerging issues, and macroecology and conservation is the topic that his award was named for. So at the University of Ottawa, Dr. Kerr has organized the Canadian Facility for Eco-Informatics Research and carried out research in North America, South America, and Africa pushing the limits of technology and the applications of remotely sensed data. Uh, he's also been involved in citizen science, and uh, people in his lab, in collaboration with him, have created this eButterfly uh, website, basically, th that's the public face for international data-driven projects dedicated to butterfly biodiversity, conservation, and education. So you're going to be hearing about all these different components tonight, and I'll, uh, I'm going to turn the stage over to Dr. Kerr, who will be telling you about satellites and butterflies, climate change, and species conservation in North America. Thank you. <laughs> 
pre-talk drink. Just do a little microphone adjustment here. Can anybody hear me? Not quite, eh? How about now? <laughs> Not quite there yet. Okay, so now that sort of blocks my face and there's that crazy reverb thing, so we must be doing better than we were a moment ago. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here this evening and particularly uh, with the opportunity to speak for the 49th Annual Arrington Lecture. Uh, it's clear that uh, Professor Arrington's legacy is extraordinary uh, and it's, I think you do him great honor by, by turning out for talks like mine. Um, but it's, you know, that legacy is, is a living legacy and it's, it's wonderful to know that you remember his extraordinary accomplishments by, by doing this on an annual basis and thinking about some of the, the issues, even as those issues evolve through time. Um, taking ideas around ecology and, and conservation and wildlife management forward. And that's, I think that's something that I hope he would view uh, in a very, very positive light. So today I'm going to talk about this intersection of uh, very new technologies around geospatial analyses and satellite remote sensing and how we can marshal some of those technologies to try to begin to address uh, some of the really pressing issues, as I perceive them, around uh, conservation at very broad spatial scales, which is where I have spent a lot of my time focusing my research energy. So um, just a quick outline. I'm going to talk a little bit about some aspects of global change that are particularly of concern uh, for this talk, and those will have to do with uh, land use change and uh, issues around species endangerment as well. And we're going to talk a little bit about climate change and some of its implications for potentially very short-term prospects uh, for conserving species, which appear to be actually measurably uh, reduced as a function of rapid climate changes. And then what I want to do is, is talk about some of the ways that we can begin to address these challenges, the particularly terrible way to discuss global change is by ending on uh, the kind of we're all going to die note. And, you know, it's just not true that these issues are insurmountable and that we are powerless to address them. And I'd like to talk about some of the ways that we, in our rather small way, have begun to try to move the ball forward uh, and deal with some of these issues and engage the public in, in providing solutions. And those solutions are out there, and we can accomplish a lot in a short time. It's just a matter of actually being motivated to do so. So I'm from Canada. We, uh, we do, of course, uh, greatly love hockey, which all sensible people should. Um, it's a famously quiet country, and, and these days, of course, we're in the news for all the wrong reasons. Um, you've probably all heard about our most impressive mayor uh, award winner, uh, Rob Ford from Toronto. Really interesting, unnecessarily colorful person. Um, but that's not the only issue that's brought Canada into the news recently. And something that Canadian scientists have started to have to come to grips with is a very overt anti-science and anti-evidence agenda that the federal government has been putting forward and, and it has led very unusually to large numbers of people wearing lab coats turning up to demonstrations on Parliament Hill. Exactly the wrong sort of person at a demonstration is a bunch of people carrying test tubes and wearing lab coats, but it's, it's getting kind of strange up north and, and people have started to try to respond to it. So if you've been following the news closely, probably the things you're hearing from Canada are probably all the wrong things um, that we wouldn't like to normally talk about. So the first thing I'm going to introduce is just some of the background information around you know, climate change and some of the basics of, the, of this issue, which are just kind of the fundamental principles. And, and here's you know, one, climate change in the present day is uh, driven fundamentally by uh, greenhouse gas emissions, especially from fossil fuel combustion. We know this with total certainty because the isotopic signature of burning fossil fuels is present atmospherically in those CO2 molecules that you can collect on mountaintops in Hawaii. Uh, 
The rate at which we're changing climate is extraordinarily fast, faster than almost any time in the last at least more than 100,000 years. Um, at a global scale, uh, we're probably going to blow right through the two degree dangerous climate change threshold. It's very unlikely we can hit that now. Uh, that's something that should concern us because the implications of climate change are extremely pervasive. And we'll touch on many aspects that are important at a kind of a human civilization level, but are also really important in the natural world. Things like sea level rise will be, are, are already happening at a pretty brisk pace. Ocean acidification, uh, increased CO2 atmospherically dissolves into oceans, creates carbonic acid, drops the pH of water, and you do things like prevent coral reefs from being able to form because it's too acid for limestone. Um, we're actually looking at possibility of uh, some areas of planet Earth becoming effectively uninhabitable f uh, by virtue of increasing temperatures beyond the capacity of humans to tolerate um, what's known as a wet bulb temperature where they just can't dissipate, dissipate heat fast enough to actually um, avoid uh, thermal risks. And then there's a bunch of really sort of crazy things that are worrying nonlinear threshold trip wires that we really don't want to hit where you might effectively as a consequence of tripping over these things push the fast forward button on climate change and start doing things that make these other problems seem kind of unimportant in comparison. So climate change is something for which there is a great deal of rather legitimate concern. And if you look across North America at aspects of climate over the last 45 or 50 years, it's clear that climate change is upon us. It is not something that we are projecting is going to start in the coming decades. It is something that is all around us and it's happening now. And there are various ways of measuring those changes through time and across space. Here's one way, which is simply uh, an agglomeration of huge numbers of climate uh, data sources from across North America that have been synthesized and stitched together to produce a temperature map annually between 1960 and 2005. And what we've done is just look for trends in wintertime temperatures over this 45-year period. And of course, there's enormous spatial variability. Some places are not seeing rapid changes in this aspect of temperature. But other places are seeing enough change that it is the makings of a biological revolution. In places in northwestern North America, minimum winter temperatures are in some areas. They are 7, maybe even 10 degrees Celsius warmer than they were 45 or 50 degree, uh, years ago. This is a world those places have not seen during the evolutionary past of most of the species you can currently find up there. So it's really rapid environmental change, and winter temperatures in cold places are fundamental in determining the biological processes that govern diversity in those places. So these are huge effects. Now, the, the traditional question about climate change is how do we know it's got to do with human activity? And of course, in one slide, I am not going to do the entire science uh, here anything like justice, but you know, it begins with an extraordinary and prescient array of observations called the Keeling Curve, which is basically just collecting CO2 atmospherically at the top of a mountain in Hawaii, Mauna Loa, um, and doing so without any particular expectation that anything was going to happen. They were just monitoring CO2 content atmospherically, taking air samples at the top of a mountain in the middle of nowhere. But this data has provided just critical foundations for knowing that atmospheric CO2 concentrations have been changing and that the isotopic signature of that atmospheric CO2 is fundamentally to do with what people are doing. This is not a natural phenomenon. This leads then to a massive array, multidisciplinary science efforts to begin to understand how different kinds of atmospheric or radiative forcing agents, as they're known, things like carbon dioxide, solar radiation, have begun to exert changes in climate, both regionally and at very, very broad spatial scales. These have been put together in the form of what are known as general circulation models, which are these incredibly elaborate physics-based models that are able to predict rather well how climate changes through time and can reconstruct recent historical observations of what climate has been doing, both regionally and at global scales. 
One of the neat things about these general circulation models is that to understand what will likely happen or what likely should have happened given recently observed changes in CO2 concentrations, you don't need them. The principles that basically govern how much temperature changes as a function of changing CO2 were actually worked out in the 19th century by a chemist, Svante Arrhenius, a very famous dude, really accomplished chemist. And his predictions for what would happen to global temperature patterns as a function of changing CO2 were actually pretty close to accurate. He got it basically right and did it in an afternoon of really intense thinking. So there was a lot of, you know, obviously there's an awful lot of really good quality research that goes on to make those models far more useful. But these models also make very powerful and secondary predictions, among them things like given atmospheric circulation patterns, we should be seeing very rapid climate changes in polar regions, particularly polar regions where there's not a lot of land, and that means the North Pole. So we're seeing this in almost real time, on an, on, on an annual basis. You can observe rapid, rapid changes in how much ice there is at the Arctic ice cap. In 2012, the lowest ice levels in recorded history. So the predictions given what we know about atmospheric circulation are that we should be concentrating heat up in the Arctic. And that looks like a place where we've been storing a lot of excess heat. And that excess heat is melting ice. And what it's doing is making the whole region darker. Less ice means more heat absorption. And it's warming extremely rapidly. And that's one of the reasons, one of the key reasons, why northern Canada is changing very, very fast in terms of its climate. Now, there's a lot more than just climate change going on, and I think there's a pretty good case to be made that at any given moment in time, climate is probably not the key factor predicting the likelihood of extinction for a given species that may be naturally rare. So, welcome to the Anthropocene. We've entered a new geological epoch, and it is characterized by the fact that energy and materials are now predominantly under the control of human actions. So that means that humans are modifying energy flows and material flows at a global scale to such a degree that we are the single most important factor determining how those things move around, how energy is shifted from one place to another, how materials move from one place to another. And this has prompted the declaration that we have entered the Anthropocene, a human-dominated epoch. Now, one of the key aspects of human activity here is the co-option, the use of land for human purposes, which tends to create widespread patterns of habitat loss. You can measure these things in many different ways. And one of the ways of doing this is by putting together satellite data sets at very broad spatial scales or global scales and looking for detectable impacts of human activity across those regions. And if you do this, one of the first things that comes back is that our Canadian experience is highly atypical. We have lots of wilderness. About two-thirds of Canada meets a normal technical definition of wilderness. And that's just about the only place left on Earth where that's true. Most other terrestrial land masses are now substantially modified for human activity. And one of the interesting things that this creates an interesting problem for us that this creates is that when you go to Europe and talk to people about wilderness, they have no idea what we mean. It's a fundamentally different kind of experience of nature that you'd have in, in England, where I've spent a fair bit of time, compared with Canada. And I talk to my colleagues you know, going out and collecting butterflies in really remote locations. And they always ask me why I do this. Why, can't you just call somebody? You just Give them a shout and like, well, I'm sorry, you know, the nearest person's about a thousand kilometers away and there's no roads. So it's a little tricky sometimes to get data from some of these really remote locations. But habitat loss is now globally pervasive and about 83, 84 percent of the surface of the earth is directly modified for human activities. So there's a very huge human footprint at a global scale and this has had a massive impact on the, the rate at which species are going extinct. And today, that rate is on the order of 10 to the third faster than what you would expect to see under natural circumstances. It is part of our job as conservation biologists to find solutions to challenges like this. But one of the, the 
key difficulties with this challenge is that it's not just one thing. We've got climate change, and we've got pesticide use, and we've got habitat loss, and we're stacking up the threats, accelerating extinctions still further, which means we have to be particularly creative about finding ways out of this problem. But one of the neat things about Canada having lots of wilderness in a time of rapid climate change is that you might expect that since many species are likely to shift north as a consequence of this climate change, that they'll end up in Canada. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm looking forward to meeting some of these new species in the very near future. Unfortunately, um, you know, Canada is not free of these aspects of global change either. I mean, we know that there's rapid climate change, but there is also a lot of habitat loss, especially in southern Canada. And that's shown here in a satellite image which is measuring what we think productivity should be across the country relative to what is actually happening. So the red zones are where the human footprint is very deep. And the kind of yellowish green is, in, is places where the relative amount of productivity is about what you'd expect in the absence of human activity. Most Canadians live in the south because it's just too cold. You know, it's a really unpleasant country in most places. So we all live really close to the border, but that means that we concentrate our habitat losses there as well. And that's what this map shows, that there are really huge amounts of habitat loss, or really there's a lot of it. And it's in the southern part of the country. Now, what does this do? it creates massive rates of species endangerment. Although Canada has huge amounts of wilderness, the majority of Canadian species don't live in those northern wilderness areas. They're pressed up against the American border just like most Canadians are. And the consequence is we've concentrated our habitat loss in the places where the species are also concentrated. So we are doing all kinds of crazy stuff with land use conversions exactly in the places where they are going to exert the greatest biological effects. So what this pair of maps actually shows you in kind of various shades of you know, Canadian socialist pink is densities of, of species at risk across the country. So the northern areas of Canada have relatively few species at risk, but there's also relatively few species up there we have fewer things to protect. There are vast numbers, really large proportions of species that are at risk of extinction in the southern regions where habitat losses are particularly concentrated. Now the other thing that's on this map uh, is protected areas. Protected areas in Canada are often enormous. And in fact, many of the really large green blobs on here, which are those protected areas, are bigger than you know, the average European country. So you have a few of those here as well, it's really enormous parks. So one of them, Wood Buffalo, for instance, it's just right in the middle on the left-hand side there, is quite a large park, it's about the size of Switzerland. And that's not our biggest protected area. But unfortunately, it's situated in a place where there's relatively few species at risk. We don't put a lot of parks in the biodiversity hotspots for various rather obvious reasons. There's huge land use conflicts in these areas, and it makes it very hard to establish large protected areas. So if you look in southern Ontario, which is the map on the bottom right-hand side, this is the place where we have the most species, and it's the place where we have the fewest protected areas. And I think it's going to be on this screen completely impossible to even see the protected areas, but they're also on that map. They're too small to see. We, we protect about a third of 1% of that part of the country. And this means that parks are not the way that we are going to manage biodiversity in the face of habitat loss in Canada. We can do a lot with them in the north, but that's not where most species are. And if the objective is to preserve more species, we're going to have to find a different solution. Habitat loss is indeed the reason that these species are disappearing. You can measure habitat loss in many different ways, and I won't get into the weeds with the details of these kinds of statistical analyses. But one of the things that we had to do in trying to measure the impacts of habitat loss on species conservation prospects in Canada was build new data sets that would actually measure something that was biologically relevant. We hadn't uh, a land cover map for Canada that was built for purposes of conservation. 
So before we did any analyses on the reasons why we were losing so many species, we first had to make some measurements that were actually going to be biologically relevant for those species. And the left-hand side is the first land use map of Canada that's, that was produced at a national scale. And it was on purpose designed to be very detailed in places where there was a lot of biological diversity. And when you make these measurements using these purpose-built satellite data sets, one of the things that you can do is start measuring biologically relevant forms of habitat loss, and that predicts numbers of species at risk across Canada rather well, better than anything else that we've discovered. So habitat loss is indeed the reason that we are losing a lot of these species, but it is also something that we need to be concerned about when thinking about whether or not species that are shifting north because of climate change are going to find it easy once they get across the border. For many of those species, they are going to be going to places where habitat loss is nearly 100%. And it's going to be awfully difficult for those species to make it through those landscapes. They're very much impermeable places for those species to travel north. Now, one of the questions that you could ask is, well, what if we just stopped habitat loss? What if we just put a halt on it in the hopes that this would arrest the decline of species that are currently thought to be at risk of extinction? Would species recover if we did this? Well, it's a good question, and it would be very useful to know the answer, but unfortunately, the answer is, in most cases, probably not. Because when we measure the amount of habitat that remains within the geographical distributions of these species at risk, so I'll apologize for having shown you another graph here, but on the left-hand side, what it shows you is that the frequency of species that are at risk of extinction that have either no measurable habitat left in their geographical distributions, that is using coarse resolution satellite data. You just can't see any habitat from space for these things. Or so little as to make almost no difference. So 5% of their, their area remains in any form of natural habitat. These are not species that are going to recover from the brink of extinction if we just kind of stop converting areas to agriculture or to urban zones. Those species will stochastically disappear sooner or later. If we are going to preserve those species, we need to recover them from the brink. And that's a problem that we are not grappling with very effectively in Canada right now for various you know, challenging reasons. But one of the things that would make that job especially difficult is if habitat losses were for urban areas. So if you want to try to convert you know, Toronto back to natural habitat, except maybe for City Hall, which might be a rather good idea these days, it is going to be a really tough thing to do. Those are incredibly valuable land areas, and they just, you just can't kind of walk into cities and say, you know, we kind of need some new prairie here. We're just going to rip down a few buildings and off we go. It's not a good way to get public support for this kind of work. So what we need to do is find out how frequently species are at risk because of the effects of urbanization relative to agriculture. And what these maps basically just show is the relative contributions of these two things. So although urban areas are situated largely in the places which you just should never have picked for them if you're interested in conserving diversity, the extent of agriculture is so much vastly greater that the, the relative impacts of agriculture in comparison with urban areas is just a huge, huge kind of margin in favor of agriculture. Agriculture is the primary reason species are at risk in Canada. But this means that maybe there's a less expensive solution than burning down City Hall in Toronto and coming up with new habitats. One of the things that you can do is start asking questions about trade-offs. So maybe there's a way that we can measure the costs of restoring habitats in places where we would gain the greatest biological benefits, but where we would minimize the relative economic impacts of looking at restoration in those places. So the question is, how do you actually measure those impacts? And there's a couple of ways that might be useful to do this if you were going to build a national strategy to prioritize habitats for restoration. One might be to measure the value of those agricultural lands and of the various 
kind of capital things that sit on those lands, you know, tractors and houses and buildings and farm equipment of all kinds. You can measure the total capital costs associated with agriculture. Another way to do this might be to look at agricultural income and say, okay, what if we just paid producers to take lands out of production for a period of time, what we call in Canada conservation easements, and set those aside as conservation areas where restoration could proceed. So you can measure the producer income in those places and replace producer's income so that they're effectively being paid not to farm on marginal areas. So one of the things you can do is, if you try to do this in a biological sense, you're going to need data on species which have lost range lost part of their geographical ranges because of the impacts of agriculture. And then look at the gap between where they used to be and where they're currently found. And those are the places where we need to think about habitat restoration to try to pull those species back from the brink of extinction. So the trick here is you want to maximize conservation benefits while minimizing the economic costs of setting lands aside for, for restoration purposes. So it's a kind of a, this ends up being a, a kind of complicated machine learning thing, which is an optimization process. And what you can do is start saying, where are the places where we need to concentrate our restoration activities? This is what it looks like across southern Ontario. If you measure across each of these grid cells, the relative availability of natural areas within those places, and then start asking what are the priorities for rest restoring habitat where we maximize benefits, that is the most numbers of species would benefit from those restoration activities, but the costs to agriculture would be the lowest. And there's a couple of ways that we can measure it. There's two things that are shown in this map. Um, in terms of these little squares, there's little green squares and there's little blue squares, but in southern Ontario, they actually overlap uh, perfectly. They're the same places. So if you picked areas based on how much the, the total value of agricultural capital was, they're actually the same as if you picked places based on producer income. And this leads to an array of priorities across southern Ontario that might yield a really positive benefit for a really large number of species. These are the places where you maximize those benefits. You can do the same thing across the prairies, prairies being a lot bigger than southern Ontario. I've scoped that map out a little bit. And in the background, that's a satellite land cover data set. And what you can see across this gradient is the same sort of analysis where you can identify priority areas for conservation and restoration where you're going to minimize those economic costs. These kinds of solutions are possible, but have never once been tried in the Canadian context. We have a lot that we can accomplish, but we've just never taken the steps necessary to try to figure out what our priorities actually should be. But you can solve these kinds of problems, and the, the kind of technical solutions to them are really not that difficult to achieve. This is not to say that restoring habitat is basically easy. I don't want to try to give you that message because it's not true. But it is possible to start establishing priorities and focusing efforts in a strategic way where you reduce costs and you maximize conservation benefits. And in Canada, we're not doing this. So the total costs for setting aside all of those areas for conservation purposes, we, you can actually measure the cost. If you actually just bought the farm, to, pardon me for saying, um, you'll end up with spending about $120 million. That's the total value of all of those little grid cells in terms of their agricultural capital costs. Or you can pay for this kind of thing on an annual basis and replace the income for those producers, and on an annual basis, those costs are very much lower. We know what the producer income is. Just replace the income, restore habitats in those places, which is, you know, again, I'm making this sound easy, and it's not. But you can do this kind of thing and begin this planning process and accomplish a lot in a very relatively efficient way. So you can accomplish a lot with relatively few economic impacts. So Canada's habitat loss challenge is a serious one, and it has imperiled a very large proportion of our species. A lot of our species that are currently recognized as being at risk of extinction have almost no measurable habitat left, and they clearly have some. It's just that you can't see it if you try to measure it using satellite data.
because there's so little of it that it's undetectable. Uh, agricultural land use conversions are vastly more ex extensive than urban areas and are the predominant cause of extinction and of endangerment of species across Canada. But I think we can accomplish an awful lot in terms of conservation in a relatively efficient way without causing the sky to fall economically. And those arguments that it's just too hard to do this job, I think, are specious. We can do an awful lot more, but the idea that we should give up without trying, to me, is unacceptable. But I think is also demonstrably uh, without good evidentiary support. You can do a lot with a lot less than people think. Unfortunately, in Canada, of course, habitat loss is not the only problem. And I began with a quick look at patterns of change in wintertime temperatures across Canada. And one of the things I showed you is that up in places like northwestern Canada, winter temperatures have changed by 8 or 10 degrees Celsius, an enormous amount, the makings of what I think is a biological revolution. You can study the effects of climate and of environmental factors on biology at multiple spatial scales, just like you can look at the wing of a butterfly at multiple spatial scales. So if you zoom in to the wing of a butterfly, you might see something like what you get up here in the upper left-hand side. This is an African monarch, Danaeus chrysippus in South Africa. And you can actually see those individual scales in this very zoomed-in, focused look at a biological realization of a bunch of complicated processes. Very small-scale look at this butterfly's wing. This is kind of what most biologists spend most of their time doing in a way. We look at problems at very localized spatial scales predominantly. About 70, 75 percent of our studies start at one square meter quadrats, and one, one square meter quadrats, and then get smaller. Some people are beginning to think at more landscape scales, and many of those people are here with us tonight. And this is a really important thing to do because processes that are really important at very local spatial scales scale up to become perhaps just fundamentally critical at, at landscape scales. If you're not thinking about patterns of habitat fragmentation or habitat loss across landscapes, you're probably not going to be very good at predicting whether or not species are going extinct. But still, relatively few people think at even more broad spatial scales than that of landscapes, whole regions, or entire continents, or big countries, and Canada's a rather big country. And we need to spend more time doing that. Macroecology is that part of ecology which spends its time focusing at those very broad spatial scales. And what I would argue is that it is poised to be essential to understand how global change is going to impact biological communities. The reason that this is true is that macroecology spends most of its time studying processes at the extremely broad spatial scales, which are characteristic of the scale of climate change. And if you compare the characteristic spatial scale at which a macroecological study is conducted to the spatial scale at which an average global change biology study is conducted, there's something like nine or ten orders of, differ uh, of magnitude difference in the spatial scales. Global change biology is mostly field biology, looking at rather localized spatial scales. And that can be really important, but it's not the whole picture. We need also to build a view of these landscapes that looks across landscapes to very broad areas. And macroecology is very good at this kind of thing. One of the things that macroecology spent an awful lot of time, and I promise it will be one of the few slides I have with dizzying numbers of graphs on them, and not intending you should actually read these things. Um, macroecology spends a lot of time asking questions like, why are there more species in some places than others? Many of you will recognize this question because Darwin was worried about the same thing. And Alfred Russell Wallace was asking the same question. And it is that question which motivated the development of the theory of natural selection, trying to understand the incredible diversity of life and its spatial distribution across the world. But this is something we can study in many ways. It doesn't necessarily only focus on evolutionary processes because species distributions in space are highly dynamic. They move around. And that is something which we can measure at these very broad spatial scales. These really big picture studies give us a sense for 
those factors in the environment that predict diversity at global scales and at continental scales. And what we get when we look at those trends is consistently that for almost every taxon that has ever been studied, if you look at their global diversity patterns, it's got to do with climate. And if you don't look at climate, when you try to figure out why there's more species in some places than others, you're probably missing something that you really shouldn't miss. And that climate picture is consistent across vast numbers of species. It's just a huge factor. Why might climate affect diversity gradients? Why might there be more species in warm, wet places than cold, dry places? There are all kinds of mechanisms, and we've spent a lot of time looking at some of these and developing some of our own factors like niche conservatism, the degree to which evolutionary lineages inherit the traits of their ancestors, and consequently their distributions are a function of that kind of evolutionary inheritance. So maybe one of the ways that we can gain insight into how species respond to climate change is by looking evolutionarily speaking at where they were coming from. So that's a possible mechanism that might explain why we see these things. Diversification rates, that's the idea that species diversify faster in the tropics. Another idea, a very beautiful, elegant one, although I think it's catastrophically wrong in metabolic theory. Um, just a, just a fantastic intellectual contribution. I just think that in terms of this issue, it doesn't really ask, it doesn't really answer the question. It's also possible that more than one of these mechanisms is important for determining why diversity gradients show such remarkable trends that are so consistent among species, so different groups of species. But I'm not going to worry about this. One of the problems macroecology has is that it's not experimental. It's generally looking at processes at very, very broad spatial scales, and in its simplest form, its most exploratory form, it's, it's a very correlative science. But we can do a lot more than just run really weak correlations at very broad spatial scales and wave our hands around about the factors that are determining gradients of diversity. And although we lack the capacity to conduct true experiments in macroecology in a very controlled, realistic sense, we do have the ability to do something else. And it's offered to us courtesy of global change. One of the things I used to say when I was talking about macroecology is that historically speaking, we could not do experiments. But then climate change really kicked into high gear. And that capacity to look at how changing global climates would change biological diversity started to become really feasible. And you can look at this kind of thing in various ways, but you have to do it through time, not just spatially. And one of the ways you can do it is by looking at historical species distributions, building models predicting them, looking at given environmental change, where do we think species should have gone over the last 50 or 60 years, and then looking at new data from recent time periods and asking if species went to the places that we think they should have gone. And you can put these together to build big kind of multi-species predictions of how diversity changes through time. And one of the things that's really important to understand here is that if you want to try to make predictions about how global changes will alter biological diversity, you need to be monitoring biodiversity over long periods of time. There's no capacity to gain insight into biodiversity in the absence of this monitoring data. And what these graphs just basically show is that when you make those predictions with large species assemblages like butterflies, you get pretty good concordance between what you think should be happening and what actually is happening in terms of how diversity changes through time. We can make those predictions rather accurately. But there is a fly in this ointment. So it's not just that species are tracking climate change, it's that there is more than one thing going on at a time. So what these two maps show you is at different times in Canada over the 20th century, spatial patterns of butterfly species richness across the country. Unfortunately, because of climate change, these patterns are changing rather quickly. And you can measure those differences if you have a really intensive series of observations that enables you to test 
for the impacts of these environmental factors. And when you put those together and start making those measurements, this is what you end up with. There is a really substantial interaction between how fast climate is changing in some places and the added effect of land use change. When you put land use change together with climate change, we start losing species. Those two factors together are a toxic mix. And at a national scale, you can see those effects across Canada for butterflies. And what you can see across the southern regions here, those blue places, are places where climate is warming and we should be seeing more species, but because of habitat losses, diversity is dropping. And diversity in the last 30, 40 years has dropped by about 10 or 15% in these places. We're losing butterflies rather fast. So climate change and habitat loss are interacting. Without really getting into this issue, I'm just going to add to this view that it is not just the study of mean climatic conditions that we should be interested in as people concerned about global change. Climate change is a violent process. And its extreme events are perhaps of even greater concern than shifting values of mean conditions. So the fact that global climate might increase by two degrees Celsius is nothing. What we really need to be concerned about is the concurrent changes in the frequency and intensity of extreme events. And those will have, and probably are already having, biological impacts. Now, so much for doom and gloom. Um, one of the things that's true in Canada, of course, is that uh, our federal government is not especially concerned with environmental issues and they have started to systematically dismember pretty much every form of environmental protection that exists and most environmental monitoring programs have either been terminated or are being shut down imminently. This is um, a problem because although we are the global hotspot for global change, it's happening faster in Canada than almost anywhere else, we're losing our ability to measure anything. So if you think back to King Canute, this is like a, about a thousand years ago, as the king of uh, Denmark and England, um, he had a lesson for his nobles, and that was you basically you can't command the tides. So you can't ignore reality, because reality isn't going to ignore you back. You might call this Canute's rule. Pretending that climate change isn't happening doesn't make it stop. We have problems that we have to deal with, and the fact that we're not making measurements anymore doesn't mean that these problems aren't continuing to become more serious. And this is an opportunity where perhaps if we try to engage the public, we can make a difference. And we need to make that difference quickly or we're going to have massive data gaps in what we understand about our natural environment. Citizen science, in my view, has an opportunity to fill some really critical gaps that are being left wide open by the retreat of governments from these issues. And one of the ways we've tried to do this, and I won't spend too long on this, is to start building citizen science sites at a national scale in Canada, now an international scale across North America with butterflies, with bumblebees, and to engage the public. And one of the things that has been most gratifying to me is this, this immediate recognition that there are huge numbers of people out there who care about these issues but don't have an outlet to show it. And if you give them an opportunity to start to engage with these issues, they seize it. In two years of the operation of eButterfly in Canada, we have increased our, the, the total number of observations of butterflies by 25% relative to a century-long record of butterfly observation. In two years, 1,500 people have been making regular contributions, sometimes of thousands of records, making an enormous difference. And this lets us get a sense for how pollinators are beginning to respond to these measurements, these, these rapid changes globally and that are being felt very, very early on in Canada. And there's been a lot of public interest in this. And it's, it's really good news because there is a huge public demand to engage with how biodiversity responds to global change. And I think we should be encouraged because eventually, if the public wants to do this, you know, and all other options are exhausted, eventually politicians might start to do the right thing. Paraphrasing Winston Churchill. So, as I conclude, habitat losses and climate changes have huge effects on biological diversity. There are many excellent 
uh, examples of biological theories that have been constructed to begin to address ways to reduce those negative impacts. But you know, one of the things we really have to do is to get ahead of this conservation curve. We are constantly fighting rear guard actions to conserve biological diversity, and it means we're losing, we're winning the occasional battle, but we are losing the war. Extinction rates continue to increase, and extinctions are forever. So I guess one of the last things I'd like to say is the idea that slowing the rates of some of these aspects of global change that can be so important, the idea that it's, it's too hard to even try is, is an odious one. I don't think we've ever really tried. So the idea that it's too hard to try is simply untested and is not, I think, worthy of us or indeed worthy of what we have inherited from our parents, but something that we certainly shouldn't be doing is inflicting these problems on our children. They're going to have to live in the world that we create. We can accomplish a lot. One of the things we've seen is that sometimes all industry really needs is an opportunity to engage constructively with conservation organizations. We've been doing this in many ways across Canada, and a great many scientists are included in efforts like this. And one of the things that has been accomplished is some of the largest conservation agreements in history. Canada has agreed to conserve uh, enough boreal forest that's equal to about three times the size of France, about 1 million or 1.2 million square kilometers of continuous wilderness area. These are partially on the basis of agreements with industry, partially on the basis of agreements with government. We can make a difference. We can do this faster than you might suspect. But you have to try. Sometimes you can make a big difference. So habitat loss and climate change have huge impacts on biodiversity conservation. This is very well known. But we can respond to more than one of these threats at a time, and what we might think of as converging responses. What, what's good for one problem might be good for another. We can do these things, and we can make them happen quickly. But one of the things we have to do is engage in respectful conservation conversations with private landowners, with civic leaders, with politicians at all levels. Listen to what those people have to say and see if you can make a difference in their outlook if they think that conservation isn't something they can make a difference with. But in terms of whether or not we need to act now, the answer is yes, we do. We need to act immediately. There's no reason to wait. There are a lot of opportunities for making a big difference in really short order, and I think we need to seize every one of those opportunities as fast as we possibly can. There's no reason to wait. There's a lot to be lost in the meantime. So. On that note, I'd like to conclude and especially to thank um, the organizers, Diane Dabinsky, James Pritchard, and the many colleagues who worked so hard to set this up. The opportunity to speak at the Arrington Lecture is an immense honor, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful for it. And also to my many colleagues, past and present, who have contributed so much to this work. Thank you very much. Thanks so, thanks so much, Professor Kerr. Um, the Iowa Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit wants to send you back to Canada with a little token of our appreciation. And uh, it's not Templeton Rye. We, uh, you'll never make it through security with that. But we'd like to give you two books uh, by Paul Arrington, Of Men and Marshes, and also the second book, a collection of essays by, by Paul Arrington called A Question of Values edited by Carolyn Arrington. So we'd like to present these to you and uh, Thank you. as a token, token of Iowa. Yeah. We do have uh, some time for questions and answers. So if you'd uh, bring your question to the microphone in the center aisle, that would be spiffy, and we could all actually all hear you. So feel free to ask any question. You can speak in French, too, because Professor Kerr does speak French. The German's right out of the question. The only language I know is English, so... <laughs> Thank heavens. It's good for me, it's not in French. Um, because, well, actually, there's many questions running through my head, but because the plant, the plant biomes 
chain, they can migrate slower than animals. Even if the animals can get across the sort of human barriers of land change, would there be a habitat there for them? Um, because, you know, like the, the climate would be correct for the species to be there, but would the plants have already gotten there for them to live there, or yeah. would you still have? This is a huge problem, and particularly in the realm of butterfly biology. Uh, the study of the distribution of host plants is really critical to understanding how they respond to aspects of global change, and there's just no reason to think that butterflies are going to do well if their host plants get left behind. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this raises a bunch of really fundamental questions. The kind of data sets that we're looking at with the species that we're looking at that particular set of butterflies, which is not all of the butterflies of Canada, it's just the ones that are rather general in their distributions, they are not particularly host plant limited. But there are examples of species that are really host plant limited, and we are losing those species particularly fast. The specialists across Canada are in the most dire shape. And one of the reasons that is surely true is that their host plant distributions are highly localized. And in many instances, even though you know, when we think about climate change effects on the distribution of these things, what we're talking about is relaxations on barriers to poleward geographical range expansion. So as it warms up, it's not too cold for them anymore to go further north. So they can expand in a, in a facultative way towards the poles, but they can't do so if their host plants aren't there. We have some very preliminary results that I, I don't think are quite ready for prime time right now, but that suggests that this is an emerging issue mm -hmm. at perhaps a continental scale uh, with some groups of pollinators that they are beginning to be squeezed badly by climate change and that one of the reasons that is happening is that their host plants are not able to track shifting climate conditions at anything like the pace that highly mobile organisms can, like butterflies. So it's a, it's a very good question. I'm just interested how um, the decline of butterflies was brought to your attention. Was brought to my attention. I or how did you notice the decline in butterflies and what made you want to study that using the satellites? Ah, okay. I, I've, I've long been interested in butterflies. I just have a thing for butterflies. And, and like many biologists, <laughs> I, I just I have a kind of natural history-based love for a group of organisms. And it just turns out that butterflies are really a great group if you're studying changes in climate. They're thermophilous organisms. They like the heat. So they do, they respond relatively rapidly to changing that form of environmental change. So it just turns out it's fortuitous or not fortuitous as the case may be that they are a particularly suitable group to look at how climate change might affect their distributions. They respond very quickly and their generational turnovers are fast and this kind of thing. How did we first begin to notice that they were declining quickly? That is very, very new. Although we have had for a long time specific information that a species here or a species there was clearly in trouble, until the last, about five years ago when we first started this work, no one had ever put all of that information together across the entire assemblage of butterflies to start asking questions about whether or not the group as a whole was seeing really serious challenges at big scales. And it turns out those challenges are profound. There is a process of what is known as biotic homogenization that's happening in Canada. What that means is that rare species are getting rarer and common species are getting more common. So what it also means is that if you go from place to place in Canada, the biological distinctiveness of those places is beginning to fade away. You're more likely to see cabbage white butterflies as you go from place to place in this kind of weedy, invasive European thing, rather than what, natively speaking, should be present in those places, and that's because of this process of biotic homogenization. So, you know, we first described that process about six years ago for Canada, and you can see these impacts in many ways. That's just one of the ways in which butterflies are being impacted by combinations of environmental change. But to do that, you have to look at the big picture as well as the landscape and the local processes. <laughs>
Um, I'm just curious um, what what it is that the satellites actually can what they can pick up. So I wish we could see butterflies reliably from space. <laughs> um, that's, that would just be like Star Trek technology. I would just love it. Unfortunately, uh, butterflies are small and have the irritating habit of not spreading their wings out um, you know, in large rows of butterflies so you can actually see them. So what you have to do is begin with a rather detailed knowledge of what matters to butterflies in the environment. So you have to spend a lot of in, you know, time and energy getting the basics of butterfly biology down. What are the things that really determine how biological processes unfold for butterflies? And it turns out that some of the things that really matter for them would be things like how warm it gets in the summer, whether or not winter temperatures drop below critical thresholds that exceed the capacity of those organisms to sustain themselves given their the, the kinds of cellular antifreezes that they produce. It gets too cold, their cells explode, and that's it. You can measure those kinds of factors using satellite-based information. And that satellite-based information in a place like Canada is particularly important because we don't have boots on the ground, so to speak, over most of the country. Canada's even bigger than the enormous United States. You know, we have 10 million square kilometers. Uh, what would that be in square miles? Uh, it's about 4 million square miles or 4.5 million square miles, something like that. So it's a biggish kind of place. And uh, most of that country is devoid of people. Even First Nations or Aboriginal peoples are not present across much of the area of Canada, although traditionally they would have been present in some places and at some times. But what that means is if you want to know what's going on environmentally in those places, you either have to have a monitoring station there, which almost never happens and is happening less and less, or you have to be able to make measurements remotely. And what satellites let you do is detect some aspects of the environment that might be very important for butterfly biology or for the biology of other groups of organisms. And as soon as you, you know, start being able to put those things together, then you can scope out and see the big picture again. And that's, that's the role that satellite data have. Now, there is actually this one example where you can see butterflies from space, but it's, it's not a very reliable one. And it's, it's in Mexico with monarchs that migrate. So you can actually take satellite images from this place at ultra high resolutions. And we have centimeter uh, spatial resolutions, about 50 centimeter spatial resolutions. And you can actually see the clusters of monarchs on the OEMLs, those trees big, huge trees on tops of mountains in Mexico, and you can see the colony of monarchs there. But it's, it's a terrible picture. And I wouldn't use it for anything. It's not very reliable data. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kerr, for your work and, and your very interesting talk. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit outside your realm now, and so I'm just really curious about your creative ideas as a macroecologist. One of the issues I've, I see is getting, uh, helping us to mitigate and ad adapt to anthropogenic climate change requires massive changes in human behavior. So how do you go about trying to influence behavior at a macroecological scale that matters to the processes that you're actually studying? Right, so three easy steps how to solve climate change. I wish I had those three. I've got a couple of them. There, you know, there are no magic silver bullets that, that just solve that problem. And, and fundamentally, you know, we're too late to stave off the early effects of significant climate change. No matter what we do right now, we will hit a degree and a half, and there is nothing we can do to stop that. 25 years ago, when Jim Hansen was first giving talks to Congress on this issue, we could have stopped it, and we spent a quarter century doing nothing. I think we have a lot to answer for, for this reason. But, you know, the question is, what do we do? The idea that it's hard to become more efficient is incorrect. Uh, you know, it's just amazing how profligate society has become. The idea that consumption is a human right, I think, is an amazing concept. And it's one that 
probably you know my generation has is largely guilty of of propagating it's not a human right and it isn't necessary we can change our patterns of consumption in ways that don't alter our economic well-being that probably actually have economic savings so if you look at some of the, what people have been saying at very broad scales and very general senses there's great papers by people like Stephen Pakala at Princeton and what he's pointed out is that about 50 percent of the things that we could do to slow climate change down is just make better use of existing technologies for energy efficiency and that's half the problem solved and you do this you implement those things and it has a net savings for the economy now it really irritates you know particular interest groups but it nevertheless has a net economic benefit for society that's what the evidence suggests but I think we should also be careful to be very honest with people who ask us, will it be easy to solve this problem? Because I think the answer at this point is that no, it's not going to be easy to solve this problem. But simple things that anybody can do, don't use incandescent light bulbs. Get zero carbon power sources. You know, in Canada, we, we do this a lot. So we, in my house, we have zero carbon um, as a kind of source for energy in our house. And there is no CO2 produced from any of the power sources that feed power to our house. The natural gas that we consume comes from landfills. The whole idea that these things are hard to do is just nonsensical. And I don't think can be defended on the evidence. Now, if we want to really solve this problem, you know, we are going to have to start making choices. You know, what are the kinds of consumption that we feel we cannot do without? And what are the things that we can leave behind? 25 years ago, the answers to those questions were probably easier than they are today. But we also know that waiting another 40 years is going to make the solutions to these problems vastly more expensive. If you look at things like the Stern Report, former chief economist of the World Bank, who's pointed out that the time to do this is right now because it's going to be cheaper now than it ever will be in the future. The United States CO2 emissions are declining because of natural gas exploitation. That's probably a good thing. You know, these technologies are not beyond us. I would talk about the fact that everybody can make, can do something within a week that will make a difference to their footprint. And it probably won't cost them anything in the long run, might even save them money. Go from there. <coughs> But start that conversation. The short answer, though, is I don't really know the answer to the question. <laughs> Come back with another question. Um, so you proposed converting agricultural lands into wildlife habitat again. I like the idea, but I have to ask the question, what do you do with the decrease in the agricultural production with right. an expanding human population. So one of the good things about the particular solutions that we've been thinking about, and this is only in the Canadian context, is that the places that we identify as having very low producer income, those are the places where agricultural production is marginal at best. Those are places where in many cases producers are scarcely breaking even, so they're not actually the crop value of those places is as small as possible. So what we're talking about then is shaving off less than just like something like half of 1% of agricultural production, but probably doing so with an economic savings because those places are largely maintained through public subsidies in one form or another. And the question is, you know, should we continue doing that or should we stop subsidizing in a perverse way and start subsidizing in a way which might be more useful from a conservation perspective. I think in this particular instance, you're, you're certainly right to ask this question, but in this particular instance, the risk to agricultural production is extremely small because this whole principle is founded on the idea that you select areas which from an agricultural point of view are the ones which have the least potential to produce something that is highly valuable for agriculture. Thank you. So hopefully nobody starves because we do something like this. <laughs>